going to cover some of the networks that Eric Prince is in the middle of, as this will help to explain the larger narrative in regards to the relationship between certain oligarchs, private intelligence, Israel, China, the Belt and Road Initiative, and the crackdown of under Uyghurs, that's the Muslim population in far western China, and uh, also now the Hong Kong protests. So this is the first joint. So Eric Prince is on the right hand side, below uh, Joe Zamel. Okay, so this is some basic information about Eric Prince. He is the heir of the Prince Corporation fortune. He is the brother of the education secretary Betsy DeVos. He's the founder of Blackwater, XC, mercenary groups. He is a managing partner of the Frontier Resource Group. He is the executive director and deputy chairman of Frontier Services Group. And he met with Joe Zamel, George Nader, Michael Flynn and Donald Trump Jr. during the 2016 Trump campaign. Prince's family have a long history of ties to the CMP. That's the Council for National Policy. A exclusive quote-unquote conservative networking group that largely controls the controlled Christian right in the United States, the Council for National Policy. So Eric Prince is connected to at least two people that we know of who are directly connected to Israeli private intelligence. One is Joel Zamel. Joel Zamel was born in Australia in 1986 the son of Gary Zamel, a wealthy Australian mining engineer and businessman predominantly related to coal, nickel and copper mining and previous director of the Australian Israel Chamber of Commerce. Gary Zamel also has done work for his son's company Wikistrat. Zamel attended the University of New South Wales in Sydney where he obtained a bachelor degree of mining engineering and later moved to Israel studying at the interdisciplinary centre Herzliya specialised in counter-terrorism and homeland security, graduating with a master's degree in government, diplomacy and strategy. He's a member of the Central Eurasia Leadership Alliance Network. <clears throat> in 2015, Zamel's Wikistrat spent a week running scenarios called the Cyber Mercenaries Project on how a US election interference campaign could be made by Russian cyber actors, which was later reported to Donald Trump Jr. in 2016. On August 3rd, 2016, Zamel participated in a high-level meeting with Trump Jr., Eric Prince, Stephen Miller and George Nader. This was followed by a post-inaugural meeting in 2016 with George Nader, Steve Bannon, former Vice President of Cambridge Analytica and Jared Kushner. After the 2016 Trump election win, Zamel's company Cy Group formed a partnership with Cambridge Analytica to jointly bid for contracts with the American government. In December 2016, George Nader used White Knight, based in the Philippines, to purchase a presentation demonstrating the impact of social media campaigns on Donald Trump's electoral victory. The meeting with Trump was later scrutinised by Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation and subsequent investigation into his links to Trump officials, which continued after the Mueller, Mueller investigation finished. Zamel's meetings with Saudi officials was also scrutinised by Mueller. In February 2019, federal agents detained Zamel at Washington Airport and he appeared before a grand jury to give evidence to Mr. Mueller about his links to American Lebanese businessman Mr. Nader. Zamel bragged to Nader that he had conducted a secret campaign which had been influential in Trump's victory a characterization which Zamel's lawyers had disputed. Zamel was paid $2 million by Nader. Zamel also had contact with Michael Flynn. Zamel had first met Nader at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum in June 2016. Now keep in mind that the Cy Group company ultimately was owned by a Duma representative, Mikhail Slippinchuk. That was uh, found out by some research by Scott Stedman. On April 5th, 2019, the Senate Intelligence Committee sent a letter to Walter Soriano, the owner of USG Security Limited based in Britain, for his communication with Paul Manafort, Michael Flynn, Cy Group, Wikistrat and Black Cube. Orbis Business Intelligence, which was a firm founded by 
Mr. Dossier, Christopher Steele. Soriano has links to Oleg Deripaska. Zamel's firm has completed work for Oleg Deripaska and Dmitry Rybalovlev. Zamel has been represented by Mark McKenzie, who specializes in reputation protection. McKenzie, a former law partner of Rudy Giuliani, has also represented Donald Trump as a client as well as Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka Trump, Eric Trump and the Trump Foundation in response to a civil lawsuit filed by the New York State Attorney General's Office as well as Eddie Gallagher, a soldier accused of committing war crimes. So Mark McKenzie is the son of Michael McKenzie, the former um, Attorney General under George W. Bush. He is also um, a long-term friend and colleague of uh, Rudy Giuliani. In fact, I made a video about a year or so ago about Rubashkin, but he got pardoned by Trump. He was a this Lubavitcher, kosher meat factory runner. Yeah, he was um, involved in all kinds of crime. Michael McKay's, he helped to get him released, and then he received these awards from Habad Lubavitch. He's also um, in a, featured heavily in a video I did called The Mayor, The Mafia and The McKayses. So there's plenty of background information you can look into there. Rudy Giuliani was also appointed to a cyber position during the Trump transitional period. So this graphic shows Eric Prince's links to Cy Group and Cambridge Analytica via Zamel and his Frontier Services Group business partner Johnson Kung Shaw Ko. It's based in Hong Kong. The current Hong Kong protests that are ongoing right now are no coincidence, believe me. And who do we find in the middle of the Hong Kong protest? The man in the middle of this network, Steve Bannon. Bannon was also paid to give a speech at an event held by CITIC Securities, which is a subsidiary of CITIC Group, the government of uh, the People's Republic of China's largest investment bank. City Group is the majority shareholder of Frontier Services Group, where Eric Prince is a executive director and deputy chairman. Chang Zheng Ming is the chairman of City Group, and he's the chairman of the board of Frontier Services Group. So that's your great libertarian American patriot, Eric Prince. Also, if you think uh, that Steve Bannon is real opposition to China or even the narrative that China isn't in fact working with these people you have been misled and the same goes for Alex Jones you know he won't expose these links but he'll cry on about the Chai Coms all day and George Soros we won't talk about the CMP Eric Prince and Bannon's connections will he? we won't talk about Israel and China Israel and Russia Russia and China etc this information that I'm presenting, this should be the benchmark. So earlier I referred to Joe Zamel being one of Eric Prince's links to these Israeli private intelligence networks on the first graphic. Well, going back to that one, the picture of the woman, Latel Lashem, who is actually linked to Carbine. Well, her, herself and Prince, they're connected via Frontier Resources Group where Latel is the executive director. She is also a co-founder of Carbine, and she's served in several roles in the company. Her partner, Amir Alice, is a fellow co-founder and the CEO of the company. Uh, Eric Prince is the managing partner of Frontier Resources Group, so that's the connection. I'd just like to say I came across this information via Bridget on Twitter and uh, Zev Shalev, so I'd like to thank those for that. Now this is a bit of information about Carbine. Carbine is a public safety technology company that has developed a coal handling ecosystem which delivers enhanced IP enabled communication features and caller solutions. Their end to end digitalized NG911 ecosystem brings all available data sources for emergency services into one response system. In 2015, the company offered services through an app, See Now. It is believed that this app or something similar is being used by Chinese authorities as part of an aggressive surveillance campaign against the Uyghur population. So if you are familiar with the social media manipulations that Cambridge Analytica 
SEO group, Emma Data and whatever company name they are operating by and using this technology through then uh, you'll understand these deeper connections to the Chinese government who have equipped themselves with this technology to implement the dystopian surveillance state <coughs> on mainland China and that isn't just against the Uyghur example but that seemingly is one of the worst. Well, they have equipped themselves with the technology via espionage, investments in Israeli startups such as uh, this Guangxi Science or business relationships with Eric Prince and Dorian Barak and a lot of this technology coming through Israel via uh, the United States whether it's through the Talpia program just their own espionage of these other um, bilateral agreements and foundations like Bird and Bard, the technology transfer programs and the handing of sophisticated high technology weapons to Israel and all that stuff it's getting back engineered or being shipped to China. We've got to put an end to these lies, we've got to put an end to this corruption, we've got to put an end to this treason. We cannot have a foreign fifth column running the government of the United States. It's as simple as that. Now I wrote an article for Rick Martin a couple of years ago, five years ago, called the Cold War Hoax which stated that it was a $5 trillion hoax on the American people. And that was verified by one of the leading Israeli fifth columnists, a uh, editor named Norman Potteretz, who edits the commentary magazine at New York City for the American Jewish Committee. And in his autobiography, he boasted that the whole Cold War was created out of nothing, simply so that the United States would have an enormous defense budget and we could uh, furnish all of our military equipment to Israel so that they could fight uh, the Arab nations. That's what it was all about. The Cold War was about Israel. It had nothing to do with the Soviet Union. And of course the Soviet Union was being supported by the American taxpayer since 1917. That's all in my book, all documented. Never been challenged by anybody. I'm sure you are familiar with problem, reaction, solution. If so, you can probably understand why the Chinese government, with these newly acquired technological capabilities, I want to provoke this uprising in Hong Kong and use a control opposition figure with a public appearance that is presented to the public as opposition to China to manage, guide, handle or incite the protesters. The Chinese government can then use the situation as a pretext to clamp down and get greater control over Hong Kong by reducing the people's freedoms and maybe ship uh, those who they perceive as troublemakers or identified as protesters with the facial recognition technology off to a gulag style camp on mainland China and in the worst case scenario I assume the people detained would have uh, DNA and blood type taken and, and that would be entered into a database related to uh, organ harvesting or one one could be uh, become a victim of human trafficking I know these are very dark topics but these activities are reality unfortunately. And if Steve Bannon and Eric Prince are aware of what is occurring. Then so if I told you that the company Frontier Services Group that Prince is a, a executive director and deputy chairman is training Chinese authorities and the company set up a, a training camp in Xinjiang region, the same region where the Uyghur population have been subjected to this totalitarian oppression you really wouldn't be surprised. Sadly, it is true. So, not only is there a link to Prince via the carbine app suspected of being used by the Chinese authorities in Jingjiang, but uh, he is a top brass of a company that is training the authorities. The company may have also trained the Chinese authorities how to use the phone application. There is also spyware being used to track the phones, the same type of spyware sold by another Israeli company, NSO Group, with strong ties to the Israeli Unit 8200, which is Israel's NSA. Now, NSO Group's uh, Pegasus software is believed to have been used to track Jamal Khashoggi before he was assassinated at the Saudi Embassy in Istanbul. Michael Flynn's Flynn Intel Group, they uh, lobbied for NSO Group, so that's another connection. So how does this fit into the bigger picture? If you understand China's Belt and Road Initiative, then you will understand that major plans 
of the project's development run through the Xinjiang province, which has largely operated autonomously due to the region's distance and insignificance to Beijing being a vast region of deserts and mountains. But the Belt and Road Initiative has changed Beijing's view on the region. As you can see in this map of the proposed Belt and Road Initiative plans, three of the major railway lines converge in the region. This is the Hong Kong Zhuhai Makar Bridge. On the 24th of October 2018, the HZMB was opened to the public after its inauguration a day earlier by Xi Jinping. The completion of this key infrastructure linking Hong Kong to mainland China and the situation in Hong Kong at present are not unrelated in my opinion. Not only does the bridge bring mainland China and Hong Kong closer, it allows China much more efficient access to Hong Kong for mainland authorities to respond to this what I believe to be manipulated uprising. It also makes it easier to transport infrastructure to build the surveillance state they desire Hong Kong to be, as well as removing people they choose to re-educate or brainwash in camps on the mainland. I used to be one of those people, like, I got nothing to hide, I'm just a student, but I was very wrong. They're targeting everyone. As long as you're going out of your house, you're being surveilled. In Xinjiang, in northwestern China, 13 million Turkic Muslims are already enduring extraordinary suppression at the hands of the Chinese government. And authorities there are building a surveillance state to be able to track their every move. Across the northwestern province of Xinjiang, an estimated one million Chinese Muslims have vanished into a vast network of detention centers for what China calls re-education. The region is now under what's probably the most intense government surveillance in the world. Every 200 meters would have a police checkpoint. And then on top of that, there are all these checkpoints at public places wherever you go. If you're Uyghur, they stop you. They would just say, where's your ID? I want to check your ID. They would punch in the ID number and then they would see everything about you. One tool at the heart of Xinjiang's surveillance system is the IJOP, or the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. The IJOP has an app that's used by police and government officials to track extraordinary amounts of personal information about individuals, ranging from their religious habits to their blood type. Human Rights Watch got a hold of a copy of the app and used a technique called reverse engineering to look at the source code, basically the design of the app. This is what it looks like when an officer pulls up an individual's profile. They enter the person's name, ID number, ethnicity, and then the officer takes a photo of the person's ID card to see if that matches the person's face. As you scroll, you see more information is being collected from the person, including their address, how tall they are, their blood type, their educational level, their occupation, their political affiliation, information about their car, license plate, driver's name, driver's ID card number. On its surface, most of this information looks like standard fare for police, but as we dig deeper into the app, we can see that ordinary, routine, legal behavior is being treated by authorities as suspect. This is what it looks like when the IJOP system has flagged someone whose phone number the system has lost track of. The IJOP system sends an alert to government officials to go and investigate the reason why that phone number has gone missing, and note if this person is suspicious and requires further investigation. Or here's another example. This is a report that the IJOP system sends to government officials about someone who used an unusual amount of electricity. The report includes the date in which the unusual amount of electricity used was logged by the system, how much electricity was used, what was the meter reading, and what is the usual range of electricity used. Then the government official is required to go and investigate this person. If you use WhatsApp or Viber or Telegram, that might be considered suspicious. If you go at the back door of your house instead of the front, the police might turn up to investigate. The list goes on. The information from the app feeds into a central system and combines with information from other surveillance systems, including CCTV cameras that rely on facial recognition software and even Wi-Fi sniffers that are used as people walk through checkpoints to pull information off their phones. The IJOP system aggregates all this data about people, flags those it deems suspicious, and sends alerts to nearby officials. These dubious criteria are being used to identify large numbers of people, many of whom are then arbitrarily locked up. 
In total, I spent about a month in different jails. I wasn't officially accused of anything or charged with anything. The official paperwork said something like, I was arrested under the suspicion of disrupting the societal order. And after that, I was basically under house arrest because they marked my ID card. It's time for the Chinese government to stop persecuting perfectly legal behavior. It's time for the Chinese government to end its repression of Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang. And it's time for it to dismantle this surveillance state. This chart shows the links from Israeli Unit 8200 to Carbine and financing of Carbine through the former Unit 8200 Venture Capital Fund, State of Mind Ventures. This venture capital fund finances Carbine. It just so happens that Consensus Business Group is a major investor. Consensus Business Group just happens to be operated by these two gentlemen, Vincent Chenguis and Julian Wheatland, who have both got strong ties to SCL Group and the group of subsidiary businesses. Wheatland operates as a front or go between for Chenguis. Chenguis has a also been involved with business dealings with another Israeli private intelligence company, Black Cube, that received some attention during the hashtag MeToo movement, as they were hired by Harvey Weinstein to target his alleged victims. So this next chart shows some of the deeper connections of SCL Group to the British establishment. So what is SCL Group. SCL Group, formerly Strategic Communication Laboratories, was a British behavioural research and strategic communication company. In the United States and other countries, SCL had, has generated public scandal mainly through its subsidiary, Cambridge Analytica. It performed data mining and data analysis on its audience. Based on results, communication would then be specifically targeted to key audience groups to modify behavior in accordance to the goals of SCL's client. The company used to describe itself as a global election management agency. London-based SCL was founded by Nigel Oakes, who serves as its CEO. In 1990, Nigel Oakes, who has a background in TV production and advertising, founded the Behavioral Dynamics Institute as a research facility for strategic communication. The study of mass behaviour and how to change it led him to establish strategic communications laboratories in 1993. Oates thought that to shift mass opinion, academic insight has gained through psychologists and anthropologists at BDI should be applied and would be more successful than traditional advertising methods. BDI became a non-profit affiliate of SCL. One of the former directors is Lord Ivor Mountbatten, a cousin of uh, Queen Elizabeth II. After an initial commercial success, SCL expanded into military and political arenas. It became known for alleged involvement in military disinformation campaigns, the social media branding and voter targeting. In 2005, with a glitzy exhibit at Defence and Security Equipment International, the United Kingdom's largest showcase for military technology, SCL demonstrated its capacity in influence operations to help orchestrate a sophisticated campaign of mass deception on the public of a big city like London. According to its website, SCL has participated in over 25 international political and electoral campaigns since 1994. SCL's involvement in the political world has been primarily in the developing world where it has been used by the military and politicians to study and manipulate public opinion and political will. It uses what have been called PSYOPs to provide insight into the thinking of a target audience. SCL Group claimed to be able to help foment coups According to its website, SCL has influenced elections in Italy, Latvia, Ukraine, Albania, Romania, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Mauritius, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan, Colombia, Antigua, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Trinidad and Tobago. While the company initially got involved in elections in the United Kingdom, it ceased to do so after 1997. 
because staff members did not exhibit the same aloof sensibility as with projects abroad. Apparently, allegedly anyway, so. SEO claims that its uh, methodology has been approved and endorsed by government agencies such as the Government of the United Kingdom and the Federal Government of the United States, among others. The British Ministry of Defence hired SEL to carry out work on at least two projects for them, and also placed SEL on List X, which allows SEL access to secret documents prior to 2013, according to uh, this Guardian article. So let's take a look at these other people. Steve Tatum, he has his own offshoot, however, IOTA Global, the original company that operated under the SEL Group umbrella. Uh, their work involves training in the cyber operations and these troll farm style fields uh, that were made famous in the fallout of the 2016 US presidential campaign. Tatum has a background as a Navy officer and uh, expert in military public relations and strategic communication. He was Director of Communication Research at the UK Defence Academy, Advanced Research and Assessment Group and led the Intellectual Development of Strategic Communication across the Ministry of Defence. He was advisor to the Commander of UK Forces in Afghanistan in 2007-18, helping to develop a groundbreaking soft power alternative to hard military force. He was a public spokesman for the British military. Tatum is the author of Strategic Communication, a primer, the British military's first articulation of strategic communication doctrine, as well as being written to aid the authors of the Ministry of Defence Doctrine and Concepts Centre's formulation of counterinsurgency doctrine. So we're really getting into the heart of soft power operations and uh, fifth dimensional information warfare. Now, there's a reason that Alex Jones is a, has a website called InfoWars. Now, you won't hear any of this information coming from him. Now, his network of clowns like Jack Posobiec may have been uh, covering up these links between Cambridge Analytica and the Trump campaign and downplaying uh, Cambridge Analytica. So, Lord George Patty is someone that I'll. Uh, I have to get into more detail about it in the future in regards to some interesting information I've come across, but uh, this chart lays out some of the links to the uh, British Military Industrial Complex company BAE Systems Antenato. Lord Marland is of great interest because of what we have been dealing with in Britain today. You know that Cambridge Analytica was used by the Leave EU and Aggregate IQ. That was uh, a Canadian subsidiary of uh, SEO Group and was utilised by Vote Leave that Boris Johnson, the now Prime Minister of Great Britain, was operating. It is no coincidence that we find Johnson as uh, British Prime Minister at this crucial time. So both of the prominent campaigns for Brexit are connected back to SEO. This Lord Marlon, who is also a venture capitalist, is a prominent shareholder in SEO Group, or was. Instantly enough, Lord Marlon is a Brexiteer, according to The Guardian. In 2007, Marlon was a key part of the team which saw the election of Boris Johnson as Mayor of London. Knowing of uh, Marlon's ties to SCL Group, you really need to question if uh, they assisted uh, Johnson's campaign to become Mayor of London. At the time, Marlon was the Treasurer of the Conservative Party, overseeing the party's finances. I find it hard to believe that this is just a set of coincidental occurrences. That takes us to this graphic. Now you may not understand this, but it's clear to me, so let me explain. Lord Marlon, Henry Kissinger and Richard Burt are members of the Atlantic Partnership Think Tank. In fact, Marlon, he is the treasurer. So again, we find he oversees the money of this organisation as well. Remember, he is a venture capitalist who is invested in SCL and oversees the Conservative Party Treasury, who people like Jen Guise donate large sums of money to. He's also an investor in SCL, yeah. 
So, Marlon can move money, move money. He's part of the upper echelon of the British establishment and linked to the US establishment, as we can see here, through the Atlantic Partnership. So, the Atlantic Partnership is an elite networking group set up to foster closer relations between the US and Europe. Well, its main impetus in Europe seems to have come from pro-US forces in the UK, including those with close links to NATO and other Atlanticist groups. Richard Burr is uh, on the board of directors of the CNI, the Centre for the National Interest, as well as a board director of the US-Russia Business Council. Burr is on the Alpha Capital Partners Advisory Board, in which Russia's Alpha Bank is an investor. I think it actually oversees the whole thing. I'm sure some of you are aware of Alpha Bank. That's uh, Mikhail Fridman's bank. He just happens to be a CFR member and he has huge ties to Israel and Russia. So, But Alpha is part of this Alpha Access Renova group, controlled by Fridman, Victor Vexelberg, Len Blavatnik, and German Khan. Kissinger's a lobbying firm, Kissinger Associates, that's now McLarty Associates. They're a member of the US uh, Russia Business Council and they lobby for a lot of um, Russian business in the United States as well as for US businesses in Russia. So, McLarty Associates received $365,000 dollars to lobby for this uh, new European pipeline, AG, a firm that's controlled by Russian oil company Gazprom. So beginning in February 2016, Richard Burt and a colleague represented the five European energy companies investing in Nord Stream 2, an expansion of the Nord Stream pipeline which would allow Russian gas to reach Europe without going through Belarus or Ukraine. Uh, Bert contributed to Trump's first major foreign policy speech on April 27, 2016 at the Mayflower Hotel. In the speech, Trump called for greater cooperation with Russia. Bert was uh, the top national security advisor to the 2016 Trump campaign. Also, that speech that Trump gave at the Mayflower Hotel, that was held by the Centre for the National Interest. Henry Kissinger, he is Honorary Chairman of the Centre for the National Interest. Kissinger advised Trump in December 2016 to accept Crimea as part of Russia in an attempt to secure a rapprochement between the United States and Russia. His relations soured as a result of the Crimean crisis. This strategically increases Russia's control of vital pipelines that connect to Crimea out of the Black Sea. This literally gives Russia control of much of Ukraine's gas and oil. Another point that you might not be aware of is that Rosneft, they have uh, received massive contracts for um, oil deals in uh, Iraq and Libya, so you can kind of get an idea of how Russia um, geopolitically are increasing their control over natural resources on the Eurasian landmass and how they have benefited from the war in Iraq and the uh, war in Libya. Okay so let's get back into some of the information about the CNI. So CNI says its objective is to work on developing new guiding principles for United States global engagement in a dramatically new international environment. The principles which would combine hard-headed pragmatism and fundamental American values. Yeah, right. <clears throat> the center has four main programs, National Security Studies, Chinese Studies, US-Russia Relations and Regional Strategy, Middle East, Caspian Sea and South Asia. CNI was previously called the Nixon Center. Now, if you I'm sure most of you would be aware that Nixon and Kissinger were instrumental in opening China to the West. Since then we've seen uh, the steady deindustrialization of the Western Hemisphere. We've seen this huge investment into China by these huge 
multinational corporations and Wall Street. Now we see the emergence of the Belt and Road Initiative, the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement Zone and the Asian Economic Union Free Trade Development. This is part of the development of the New World Order that Kissinger spoke about in the past and the big industrialists like David Rockefeller. So this is a topic of the big new Brzezinski's The Grand Chess Board regarding the landmass of Eurasia as the centre of global power. Brzezinski sets out to formulate a Eurasian geostrategy for the United States. In particular, he writes, it is imperative that no Eurasian challenger should emerge capable of dominating Eurasia and thus also of challenging America's global preeminence. Much of his analysis is concerned with geostrategy in Central Asia, focusing on the exercise of power on the Eurasian landmass in a post-Soviet environment. In his chapter dedicated to what he refers to as the Eurasian Balkans, Brzezinski makes use of Mackinder's heartland theory. This is Brzezinski with a man behind the Eurasian movement, Alexander Dugin. Now if your goal was to create a new world order and wanted to have control of Eurasia, it would be a pretty good idea to create a Eurasian movement yourself with a cult-like leader at the helm like Alexander Dugin. You could uh, use Dugan to lend support to someone like Donald Trump and be a major influence connected to the alt-right movement, claiming to oppose globalism and is promoted on other false opposition platforms like Infowars that also promotes a pro-Putin message. Like Brzezinski says, whoever controls Eurasia controls the world, so in theory Eurasianism is globalism. So just to bring this full circle, I mentioned the USRBC, the US Russia Business Council. Well, they partnered with Skolkova Foundation's Startup Village on May the 29th of 2019 to organize a panel featuring three USRBC member companies, which is Microsoft CEO, for startups in North Asia. Cities, uh, head of venture investments in Israel and Pepsi's Senior Director for Insights to share how US companies are working with startups around the world and in Russia to advance innovation. So Skolkova Foundation Startup Village is Russia's biggest startup event and Viktor Vexelberg, he is in uh, charge of the Skolkova Fund. His name is listed here as a participant in a US-Russia business meeting with the President of the US-Russia Business Council. Vexelberg's Renova Group. They own the venture capital company Columbus Nova, which Vexelberg's cousin, his name is Andrew Interator, operates. So Andrew Interator uh, donated $250,000 to Trump's inaugural fund and $35,000 to a joint fundraising committee for Trump's re election and the Republican National Committee. So during uh, 2017, Columbus Nova made payments of at least half a million dollars to a bank maintained by, sorry, a bank account maintained by Michael Cohen, then acting as President Trump's personal attorney. So guess what else? Columbus Nova and Intrader are major investors in the Israeli company Carbine. I'll just leave you with this uh, little tidbit to bring this full circle. So you've had a nice little tour around this global network. The US RBC are partnered with St. Petersburg's International Economic Forum. This is from the website. The US Russia Business Council is pleased to support the International Conference on Securing Investment Growth in Russia, InvestRus. The conference will provide the international business community with an opportunity for direct dialogue with senior Russian government officials on ways of improving the investment climate and identifying new investment opportunities in Russia and other Eurasian economic union markets. The agenda will focus on legislation and regulatory improvements and highlight new opportunities in specific Russian regions and industry sectors. 
The speakers will address measures for protecting investors attracting foreign investment in export-oriented projects and encouraging investment by business owners. In addition, the conference will feature expa expanded meetings of the coordinating councils for waste management and agribusiness development in Russia's central federal district and a St. Petersburg International Economic Forum session on investing in Russian regions. And remember Cy Group when I mentioned earlier, Scott Stedman ultimately found that Duma representative Mikhail Schlippenschuk was the owner. Okay, so the 400 multinational corporations that are represented by the US Russia Business Council. They support the Eurasian Economic Union. They're designing it. They're creating the regulations influencing the whole project. I'll leave you with this so we can say that we've really come full circle. Remember Cy Group, as I mentioned earlier, Scott Stedman ultimately found that Duma representative Mikhail Slippenchuk was the owner. Well, Joel Zamel, he first met George Nader at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. So with that, I'd like to say good day. Thanks for listening.